Just a few days ago, I was in a car on my way to one of the most beautiful places on this planet. I was taken by Rob and Margie Cabasco to see the Grand Canyon, a place that I've seen on photos, on my screensaver, on my computer. I've seen some videos, YouTube of a drone flying over this canyon. And so I had this mental image of what it would look like, and yet I'd never seen it with my own eyes. When we went through the entrance of the park that leads up to the Grand Canyon, the only thing I could see were pine trees all over the place. This area of uh, that particular state is very high, uh, high up, and so the air is a bit thinner, it's a lot cooler than in the rest of Arizona, and uh, there was nothing that indicated that I was about to see this, you know, incredible place. Margie, who was uh, guiding the car, told me that there is a tradition that if this is your first time that you're going to see the Grand Canyon, you have to be blindfolded, or at least close your eyes. So when I stepped out of the car on the parking lot, they asked me to lower the, the, the baseball cap that I had on my head, to lower it over my eyes, to close my eyes, and then uh, Margie took me by the hand and she said, I will guide you to the edge of the Grand Canyon. Something that didn't entirely put me at ease, the edge of the Grand Canyon. But I was, of course, very obedient. I closed my eyes and step by step she led me over this small path to the edge of the Grand Canyon. It was a scary moment because you, you, I'm not used to not seeing where I walk. And this was a foreign country to me, a foreign place. And I was afraid that I would bump into a tree or maybe stumble into someone. But thanks to Margie who was walking beside me, and uh, I think that Rob was filming me with his iPhone, I was in safe hands. And so at one point, they told me to stretch out my hands and I could feel the cold metal well, cold, it was a little bit warmed up, the metal of the railing of the, the balcony that was separating me from the Grand Canyon. And so I adjusted my baseball cap and then they told me, now open your eyes. And I was speechless. There in front of me was this incredible vast valley that stretched out as far as the eye could see. It went down hundreds of meters below. The air was brimming with the, the heat and you can see all these crevices, this, 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 these huge paths that the water of the river has carved into the earth for thousands and thousands of years. And then the wind has also continued to erode the landscape. So you could see all these different lines in the, in the, the mountains below and in the, the crevices below. And it was, just so mind-blowingly big. Nothing that I'd seen before could have prepared me for the overwhelming feeling of awe that I had when I opened my eyes. It was so much bigger, so much wider, so much farther and so much deeper than I could have ever imagined. And this is exactly what happens when the Holy Spirit descends upon the apostles. This is a similar situation. Let me explain. In the Acts of the Apostles, we read about this coming of the Holy Spirit. The disciples are again back in this upper room where they stayed with Jesus right before he was arrested, where they celebrated the Last Supper. And they are there at his command, together praying. The tradition also shows that Mary, the mother of Jesus, is there. And they're all open to God, their eyes closed in prayer. They can't see the future. They can't even see what's happening outside of their windows because the windows and the doors are closed like they used to do after Jesus was, was crucified. They're inside and their view literally is blocked. It's almost as if they are blindfolded when it comes to the future and the next step. They don't know what they have to do next. They don't have a plan for, you know, the next seven years. Jesus didn't leave them with, uh, uh, like, this is what you're going to do and just follow these steps. No, 
The only thing that Jesus told them before he went back to his Father in heaven was, go back to Jerusalem and pray and wait for the Holy Spirit. And this is very counter to our, you know, our natural desire to take hold of the future, to plan, to structure, to, you know, come together and do a brainstorm. So what's going to be the next step? The only thing that Jesus asked them to do was to wait for the Holy Spirit and to pray. This is literally a situation where they're blindfolded. They can't see the next step. But after this novena, these nine days of prayer, something begins to change. And the first thing that this, this reading describes is they hear a sound. And maybe that's on purpose, that there's first sound because they still have their eyes closed in prayer. And it's the sound of the wind that is hurling and, and, it, it, and it starts to fill the house even. And when they open their eyes, the reading describes that they see something that looks like tongues resembling fire. And so not only are their ears filled with the sound of change, but their eyes are filled with the blazing light of this fire from heaven that comes into their heart and fills them and then burst out of the seams. They open the doors, they go outside, the Spirit pushes them into the world. And then it is as if the future is all of a sudden wide open and so much grandeur and bigger and, and, and unimaginable. It's right there. What happens next goes way beyond anything that they expected to happen or to see. Everybody in the city, and they are there for, you know, the, for a feast. Everybody, this is also, it was a Jewish uh, celebration. People from all over the world were there in that city. And the Acts of the Apostles described all these different areas that they come from, the different languages, different cultures, and yet everybody is amazed because they can understand the Apostles. So not only does the Spirit help these, these Apostles to speak eloquently, to proclaim with joy and courage, but the Holy Spirit also works in the ears, in the minds, in the hearts of those that are there to listen and helps them to decipher this language and to understand it, each in their own language. It doesn't matter where you are from. The Word of God that is proclaimed is for each and every one of them. And this is the miracle of Pentecost. This is this, this wide open future that is there in front of these apostles. They must have been amazed to look at that crowd and to see that people are reacting to them. Maybe they themselves didn't even understand what was going on. After all, they were, most of them were fishermen. They had no education. And yet their word goes straight to the heart of all the people there in the city. And then after that morning of Pentecost, this would continue. These apostles would be traveling the world go by boat or on a, on a, on a horse and, and travel to these faraway regions where they didn't know the people. And everywhere the word took, took hold of the people and small communities, communities started to emerge. More people started to follow Jesus. And then the next generations would take over this, 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 this mission. They too would travel and they would travel all the way to our countries, to our cultures throughout the ages. This one spark of the Holy Spirit, this fire, just started to work and to spread all over the world. And throughout time, no matter what happened, even though there have been times of great darkness, but the light of the Holy Spirit always proved to be stronger than the darkness. This brings me to Obi-Wan Kenobi. You may not have seen the new episodes yet, or maybe you've already watched the first three episodes that are now on Disney+. Plus. But I'm not going to give you any spoilers. I just want to mention one thing that Obi-Wan Kenobi says when it comes to the Force, which I think is really helpful in understanding the Holy Spirit. After all, George Lucas, when he created Star Wars, was heavily inspired by Buddhism, but also by Christianity, and especially the Force, the way in which 
the force is developed in the stories is very similar, not entirely identical, but it is similar in many ways to the ways that we can understand the Holy Spirit. The only difference is that the Holy Spirit is always in the Christian tradition described as a person. So it's got, it's more than just a force or an energy field. It is a personal love that is given to us. But in many other ways, there are similarities. So at one point, there is this, this young child who asks Obi-Wan Kenobi, what does it feel like to feel the force? How does it feel? And Obi-Wan thinks, and of course this takes place way years before he explains the force to Luke Skywalker uh, in A New Hope. And he, he ponders a bit and he, he, he tells the, the child, do, do you know how it feels when it's dark and you are afraid? Yeah, I, I know how that feels. So what do you do when you're afraid in the dark? You turn on the light. How does that feel? That is how the force feels. And I thought it was such a beautiful description of the concept of the force in the world of Star Wars, but also such a beautiful metaphor of what the Holy Spirit does. In, in, this, in this reading of the Acts of the Apostles, we we hear about you know, wind and then fire. And so you think that the, the, the Holy Spirit is something spectacular, something you know, that makes, has a great impact. But there is also this very humble, modest nature of, of the Holy Spirit. It's when you are afraid and you turn on the light, it fills you with, with peace. You're no longer afraid. It gives you, it shines on everything around you. The Holy Spirit himself may be invisible, but you see the effect that it has on the world around you. Just like the light itself is invisible, but you see the light through the reflections that, is, that it is causing on every object that it touches. This is how you can discover the Holy Spirit. It chases away the darkness in the world. It helps chase away the fear that you have and it opens your eyes to see the next step and in that respect the Holy Spirit is just as impressive as that moment where I opened my eyes and I see the Grand Canyon right there in front of me the future that the Holy Spirit started on Pentecost is very much that the future is wide open you can see all the way to the horizon the light of the Holy Spirit guides you and lightens your path and helps you to clearly see where you have to go. The light not only shines for you on your path, but it also shines on the world around you. The Holy Spirit is not only working in the hearts of the apostles, giving them uh, inspiration for what they have to say, but the Holy Spirit just as well works in all the people that are listening. The Holy Spirit helps you to understand his message of love and to recognize it in others. This is what I experienced during the four days that I was in Anaheim for the Star Wars celebration. It is an unusual environment for a priest to walk around. And some people asked me if I were cosplaying because I was walking around in, well, priestly vestments. I had to assure them, no, I am a real father, <laughs> I'm Father Roderick. And some people recognize me from YouTube, from TikTok. And also quite a few people came up to me and told me how much they had been uh, helped by this mass that we are streaming, the mass for geeks, and how much that helped them through these you know, dark times of Corona where everybody was at home and the churches were closed. And it was touching and moving to see and to meet people that I had no idea were part of our community. And that the Holy Spirit was able to reach them through these homilies, through these masses, through the internet. And how much the Holy Spirit was able to establish this connection between us that are gathered through these digital means. It was literally eye-opening to see the impact, not of this particular initiative, but to see the impact that the Holy Spirit has, 
the moment you try to connect with others. And something else that really struck me was how, how much love and friendship there was during those days. How much you could walk up to everyone and just start a conversation and people would help each other, they would laugh and, and, and be enthusiastic. And I, I really feel that in the storytelling, I've given this a lot of thought, the storytelling that you see in Star Wars is more than a little inspired by the gospel. Maybe even without the writers actually realizing this. But I was listening a lot to Dave Filoni, who is now one of the main writers of the Star Wars stories. And the way he talked about self-sacrifice, about seeking the light, negating yourself, asking forgiveness. He had this wonderful talk where he explained that Star Wars is not simple. It's not just, oh, just choose the light side and then you're good. Or all oh, those guys that are following the dark side, this is just the easy. No, he said, the dark side is in each and every one of us. But we are called to ask for forgiveness, to turn towards the light. This demands effort, sacrifice. And so following the light side of the force is not easy. It is, it's, it's a struggle. And, and I'm listening to him and I'm thinking, I don't know where you get this from, but I wouldn't be surprised if he had a Catholic upbringing or that in his family there was this Catholic tradition. Maybe Filoni sounds Italian, so maybe there is a bit of that background. But there is definitely a very strong Christian, you could say, context of these stories that are told in this fictional universe of Star Wars. And it is a great help for me to build bridges, to use the language of Star Wars and to connect it with the message of the gospel from, I think, a lot of these values and intuitions spring forth. And when the, the Star Wars stories talk about the Force, they use a lot of the imagery and metaphors that are also used in the Bible to explain the workings of the Holy Spirit. And I will never forget that one phrase like, if you're afraid in the dark and you switch on the light, how does that feel? It feels safe because you can see. And that is what the Holy Spirit does. We don't have to make plans. We don't have to create the future of the church or of the gospel. We are often walking around blindfolded and we don't even know the next step. But what God asks us through Jesus is not to plan everything out. But if we don't see where to go next, to stretch out our hands so he can take it, so he can guide us. And he will tell us when to open our eyes and he will show us the grandeur of his future. Amen.